All right, reaction rates and rate laws, it's time. And uh, get ready for your brain to start to melt a little bit in this process. Reaction rates isn't too hard, but the rate loss piece um, can be challenging to some. So the concept of reaction rates is a fairly straightforward one. It's the change in the concentration of reactants and products over time. In this sense, you can think of this as how quickly the reactants disappear and how quickly, by converse, how quickly the products appear. So imagine this. Imagine this very simple reaction here where we have one reactant and another reactant which come together to form this third product. And there's going to be a rate at which the stuff in this beaker is consumed and a rate at which the stuff in this beaker is consumed and then a rate in which this stuff is actually formed. And we can actually determine these rates experimentally, which is exactly what we're going to be doing in lab this week. And the, way that the rate that we are looking at isn't sort of miles per hour or um, a rate that you typically think of. It's actually molarity per second. Molarity per second is the unit that we're looking at. So that means we're going to be talking about solutions of things if we're talking about molarity. And we're going to be talking about how much of the ions or the molecules that are dissolved in that solution get consumed versus how much of the product that's created, which also will be in an aqueous solution, gets created. It really doesn't make too much of a difference whether you're focusing on um, whether you're looking at how much the reactants are being consumed or the products are being created. Um, you know, you can look at either way. However, when we um, put this together symbolically, we do need to make sure we pick one or the other, and we are going to create something called an average rate of reaction. So let me write that down. Kind of need to move over here. So it says average rate of reaction equals the change in the concentration of whatever you're picking, reactant or product. And it's very important that you understand this bracket that I've put here is the symbol that we'll use for concentration. So whenever you, you would read that as the change in the concentration of your reactant when you see those brackets. And of course, since this is a rate, the denominator is going to be change in time. Okay, so now let's shift our attention to another concept. And that concept is called the reaction mechanism. Now, essentially, a reaction mechanism or reaction mechanisms are simply a series of steps. And this actually, it, it might be easiest to think of it in this way. I want you to imagine that it's the uh, Thanksgiving evening and there's a huge mess of plates and dishes that are hanging out ready to be cleaned. And so that's what we got going on right here. Somebody needs to bring them from the table to the kitchen sink to make sure that they get washed. So we have one part of this sort of mechanism of getting these dishes cleaned are bringing the dishes away from the table to number two. Number two is the sink where the, wash, the, the dishwashing is actually going to take place. So that's going to be another part or another part of our step of getting these dishes clean. And then number three is to dry and stack the dishes. Now, you could even say that there would be a fourth mechanism, which is to put away the dishes in the cupboard, but let's just say that this only has three parts of this whole reaction mechanism, so there are three different steps. I think you totally understand what's going on here, and that while one could say, call this whole thing, cleaning the dishes, you could also imagine you could break it up into these three distinct jobs and have three different people doing it. You could have one person bringing the dishes to the sink, one person doing the actual washing, and another person stacking them, drying them and stacking them. Don't forget, however, that the overall endpoint here, so the product, is to have clean dishes. Now let's take a look at this with an actual chemical example. So here's our equation. We have four HBRs and 
water, uh, I'm sorry, an oxygen gas combining to form water and bromine gas. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment, that the probability of having four oxygen molecules colliding simultaneously, I'm sorry, four molecules of HBr simultaneously colliding with one molecule of oxygen is actually fairly small. Now, again, these things all have to collide at the exact same time. You may not have realized that in, in, that concept until this point, frankly, that you probably didn't think too much about probability when it came to a, uh, a chemical reaction. But indeed, that becomes a very important aspect of the rate at which chemical reactions take place. So you should understand that in reality, the reaction here takes place in a series of small steps each of which have a higher probability of happening. Not unlike the washing the dishes thing. So you have one step is clearing the dishes off the table, two, washing them in the sink, three, stacking and drying. Um, it's much easier to get your the, the kids in the family to break up the job than it is to have one kid accept the responsibility for doing the whole thing by his or himself. So that's sort of the same concept that we have going on here. So what are those small steps? Let's take a look. So here are the three small steps that you could break up that first equation, the one that I've written in red, into. And the other thing that's important here is to note that the products of the previous reactant uh, reaction are the reactants in the next one. Okay, so if you take a look here, we have HOOBr being produced and then it becomes a reactant in this, react, in this uh, number two reaction. And the HOBr is produced here and becomes a reactant in this third step. Okay. Now, each of these things, this, this, these three steps here, are called elementary steps. And when you write out this um, set of elementary steps, we call that a reaction mechanism. It's a couple of very important terms for you to stash away in that brain of yours, elementary steps and reaction mechanisms. Um, oh, and I guess another thing that you should also uh, have in your brain is that this right here, this HOOBR, and then this HOBR, those are called intermediate products, intermediate products. Um, because you can see here that this set is equivalent to what we have going on up here, which are the actual final products that are going on here. Now here's something that I think is pretty interesting, which is that these three steps, these elementary steps, don't actually take place in the same rate, with the same rate. In fact, this first one is actually a fairly slow reaction, whereas these last two are much faster. Okay, so you have, what that means is, one of these elementary steps in our reaction mechanism is going to be what's called the rate-determining step. Okay, so just as I've written there, number one, the, number, the first elementary step, is the rate-determining step for this whole reaction mechanism. Now, this isn't um, probably something that's too difficult to understand. In fact, if we go back to this process, I want you to imagine with this dishwashing metaphor that I'm using that the rate determining step is this one right here, washing the dishes. Frankly, it doesn't take too much time to bring the dishes to the sink, nor does it take a whole lot of time to stack them and dry them. So this becomes the slowest part. And as a result, because this is the slowest part of this mechanism, then this becomes the rate determining step, the washing of the dishes. So in a sense, think of number one, up here as being the washing of the dishes part of this whole reaction mechanism. Furthermore, what this means is if we want to, say, increase the um, reaction rate, that means that we really need to focus in on this part of the step. So in other words, you could potentially bring in um, another person to help do the dishes, to help wash the dishes, or you could have three sinks going, and that would increase this part of the reaction mechanism and make it go much faster. Now, how do we do that with regard to an actual chemical reaction? Well, it's actually pretty simple. What we do is we increase the concentration of the reactants um, so that we could make it go faster. More specifically, we want to increase 
the concentration of the reactants in the rate determining step. So if we're looking at it here, I'd want to increase the concentration of the HBr and the oxygen because that's the slow part of this thing. So if I increase the reaction, uh, the, the concentration of these things, my whole reaction is going to go faster. Now you might ask yourself, what the heck does that mean? Why would increasing the concentration increase the rate? And that has completely to do with the fact that you're increasing the number of collisions that will take place between the, um, the reactants that are involved. We're going to be talking about that more later on in the future, but understand that it's all about collisions. So let's new move on to uh, rate laws. And with rate laws, we take into account that concentration that I was just speaking about moments ago. Okay, and as you can see, what I've written out here, you can predict the rate of a chemical reaction based on the concentration of a reactant in the rate determining step. And that's kind of an important thing that we're going to be focusing in on that rate determining step. If you recall, going back to here, number one was the rate determining step. So, uh, as long as you keep all the concentrations the same, except for one, so everything's going to be constant except for one, this becomes a fairly easy task to figure out, uh, predict the rate of the chemical reaction. So I can also represent this in a mathematical form as follows, where rate is equivalent to a constant of proportionality times the concentration of A raised to the X and the concentration of B raised to the Y. That sounds pretty scary, so let me break this down and explain what we're going to be looking at with these numbers and these variables. Okay, first, uh, predictably, the bracket A and bracket B are the molar concentrations of the reactants, both A and B, in moles per liter or molality. Oh, sorry, molarity. And X and Y are exponents that are determined experimentally, and this is exactly what we're going to be doing in lab on Thursday. And then lastly, K is the proportionality constant that I spoke of earlier, which is a fixed value at a given temperature. And now that's an important thing. I'm going to have you underline that piece um, because it's going to change depending on the temperature that we're looking at. Now, there are some times, obviously, where you have more than just two reactants, where you might have three or four or whatever number of reactants. And when that's the case, if I were to create this mathematical relationship, this rate law for that reaction, it would look somewhat the same, except all you need to do is simply add on a, the extra couple of variables, like so. So you can see here that I simply added in a C for that third reactant, and a um, superscript, or the exponent of Z, associated with that particular reactant. Okay, so what does this all mean, this strange thing called the rate law? Well, let me apply some numbers to this so it makes a little bit more sense. Let's start off with the simplest situation here. And if that's the case, I want to tell you, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, that X and Y is equal to 1. They're both equal to 1. Now, of course, this is not something you would know ahead of time. This is something that you would have to determine experimentally. So what exactly does that mean? Well, again, you wouldn't know that x and y equals 1 yet. You would do an experiment, and that would lead you to x and, one, x and y equals 1. So in this case, imagine I have a setup where I decide to double okay, this a value. So double up a. And when I double up A, it causes the rate to also double. The other thing I want you to focus in on here is that I'm not changing B. I'm keeping B the same. All I'm doing is messing around with the concentration of A. So I've doubled A's concentration and A's alone. Now, if I double the concentration of A and my rate also doubles, that means that the X value has to be a 1. Now, why is that, you ask? Because if I have, instead of having A, I have 2A, and my rate also is 2 times the original rate, then that means that I have essentially here, if you take a look at this, imagine I have a 2 in there. 2 raised to the power of 1 still stays 2, and so that means this whole expression here is going to double, which means 
this whole expression here together will double. And again, I haven't, I've decided I'm not changing this one. I'm keeping everything, the only thing I'm changing is the A. Now I want you to imagine that I'm going to have a different exponent. Instead of having the x value be a 1, I'm going to have the x value be a 2. So you can see there I just changed that 1 to a 2 for the exponent. Now when I double a, the 2 that's in there, that's red, is raised to the second power. And so what is that going to do? Well, that's going to be make this whole expression four times larger. This whole expression together will be four times larger because 2 to the second is a 4. And that means that this rate will also increase. So it's going to be four times faster. Now, a really good question would be, what if it turns out that when I doubled my concentration of A, I got a rate that was eight times faster? If that's what the case was, then I think you could predict, if you take a moment, that if I doubled A and I had a rate that led to it being eight times faster than the original, when I, when I only had um, the one concentration of A, again, I'm not going to mess around with the B, but the only answer I could get for this, for this, this uh, X value here, is if that X value were actually a 3. And I think you all understand that 2 raised to the third power is 8, which would mean that this whole expression would be 8 times faster than the original, and that would jive with the fact that my rate was 8 times faster than the original. And again, the original being this, where I don't have, I haven't yet doubled up the A value. All right, I know this is all really hard to fathom initially. It'll actually make more sense as we go through this lab. Um, in some ways, uh, when you talk about this theoretically, it's harder to understand than when you're actually doing it live. Goodbye.